Hello, I'm Charlie Winterbauer, co-chair of the Southeast chapter of the Native Plant Society. And today we are continuing with our Native Plant uh, Festival that we held whole every, every September in uh, Wilmington. Today we have Paul Hosier, and Paul Hosier is a coastal plant ecologist with a PhD from Duke University. He served as professor of biology at, the UN, at UNCW for 41 years and is currently Professor Emeritus at the institution. That means he's retired. Paul, take it away. Thank you very much, Charlie. I appreciate it a whole lot. And uh, welcome to everyone who might be listening or watching or whatever you can do with, uh, with Zoom. Uh, I'd like to uh, begin by uh, talking about native plants and uh, especially along the coast. And so let's begin by looking at, at sort of a roadmap of what we're going to talk about today. The first, uh, first thing I wanted to talk about is uh, coastal plant environment and habitats because they are really unique uh, in the coastal area, quite different from what you might find in Durham or in uh, Charlotte or somewhere like that. And, and those of, of you that that may have moved from those areas uh, well know that uh, this is not the same environment you came from. Also want to then move to the different kinds of plants that uh, just a, a few examples of the, the kinds of plants that you'd find in those uh, uh, coastal areas of dunes and the maritime grasslands, the maritime shrub and forests, and the tidal marsh uh, areas. And uh, that, these particular communities will hold a unique set of, of plants, but at the same time, the, these plants could be planted in a, a, a freshwater or a uh, fresh environment uh, away from the coast. So these are not uh, absolute requirements to be along the coast. And it would be interesting to try some of these because some of them are quite beautiful and quite interesting. Then I wanted to talk uh, just a couple of minutes about the, what I call the bad boys. The bad boys are those plants that uh, you don't want. You, uh, these are uh, invasive plants, they're non-natives, and uh, they can be, play havoc in, in a, a uh, native plant garden and, and not something that you want uh, to have. And then uh, really close with a few interesting plants and uh, that you might find in the coastal area. And that's just, ex just a sampling. And really what I'm here to do is cheerlead for native plants, using native plants. And those of you that are, are, are very close to the, the coastline on the barrier islands or just a, a little bit inland from the, from the coastline will uh, find a lot of plants that, uh, that you can use in your native garden and others that are more further inland uh, can find plenty of other plants that, that we'll talk about that are considered coastal but uh, will grow very nicely in a native plant garden. So let's talk about the coastal environment. It is a very unique uh, environment in that wind and salt aerosols prevail. Uh, those of you that, have, that go to the beach every year or every month for that matter, uh, find that the wind is one of the things immediately when you strike the coast, you go, wow, it's, uh, it's really windy here uh, compared to further inland. And that seems to be set up by uh, the differential in temperature and, and the nearness of the, the, uh, the ocean. And salt aerosols, uh, as the ocean waves break on shore, you find that the salt aerosols are uh, generated and uh, thrown into the atmosphere. And that really affects the plants in concert with the wind blowing the, the salt aerosols landward that uh, create, uh, for example, that first photograph you see in the upper right hand corner is uh, uh, a plant that is strongly affected by salt aerosols. And you've seen those along the, uh, the coastline. Another example of, of an environmental factor is, is salt water and the tides. Anytime you're near the shoreline, the chance of salt water and also the tides affecting you uh, is, is very likely. And as a result, 
uh, the salt water and tides will impact what kinds of plants grow where. Again, familiar with the coastal area, you go there for a suntan to get the full radiance of the, the, the sunlight and the warm temperatures during the summertime, especially, and even year round because the temperature, the coldest temperatures are moderated by uh, the nearness to the large body of water, the ocean. So this is uh, temperature wise and with the amount of radiation uh, received uh, it affects what kinds of plants can grow there. Soils also, again, those of you that may come from the inland area are familiar with the silts and clay type soils. And you come here and start digging in your, your yard and, and uh, area that you're interested in. And it's nothing but sand. And I mean, nothing but sand. It, it's uh, quartz, fine quartz crystals and quite unlike what you find in the Piedmont or in the mountain areas. And so soils, the, the ability to survive in these soils is very important. And those plants that we find along the coast are well adapted to that soil because the water content is usually quite low with very near the surface and then gradually gets uh, wetter as you, as you dig down into the soil. And nutrients, same situation. Nutrients usually are tied to uh, clay micelles and that sort of thing that are on uh, silty and clay soils. In sandy soils, the nutrients go right on through uh, the soil and, and down to, to the water table and are really not available for, for in large quantities or for very long uh, when, uh, when you're in the coastal area. Naturally, when you think of the coastline, especially in the last 20 years or so, you think of storms. And when I say storms, I am talking about hurricanes, but I'm also talking about uh, winter storms, the nor'easters. And they can have a really significant impact because they're much more frequent. They're not nearly as intense, but they are frequent. One intense storm like that, uh, if you can look at the history books, so to speak, the storm in March of 1962 that hit the Outer Banks, that was a huge nor'easter, March being in the wintertime. And that had a tremendous change uh, on the shoreline in terms of, of uh, inlet production and shoreline erosion and flooding, uh, dramatic. So both summer hurricanes and winter nor'easters are important factors. And then finally, you can see uh, the bottom photograph there, uh, human development, any kind of development. You look at a place like Wrightsville Beach or uh, Oak Island, and you know, it's almost wall to wall human development in, in some of these areas. And uh, as a result, uh, the humans have influenced the distribution and the, the types of plants that are found there, oftentimes bringing uh, new plants and bringing in invasive plants that uh, impact the natural environment. So that's the setup, so to speak, for what we'll talk about or background to the coastal environmental factors. So beginning with the dune systems, this slide depicts the five major plants that we find in uh, eastern, southeastern North Carolina. And uh, these will be plants that are extremely well adapted to moving sand. You'll notice immediately that four of these are grasses. The grasses are usually uh, plants that can tolerate uh, sand burial. And sea oats and American beach grass are, are two great examples. American beach grass is common uh, in the northern part of North Carolina on the Outer Banks and really uh, peters out in terms of its natural distribution at Cape Hatteras. And sea oats usually picks up about that same point and, and goes all the way down to the shorelines along Florida, the Gulf Coast, and into Mexico for that matter. These, uh, these particular plant species, along with panic grass and, and salt meadow cord grass and sea elder, uh, are uh, plants that the more you bury them, the faster they grow. 
And so they're uniquely adapted to constructing dunes. So as the sand is blown off the inner tidal zone, that is the, the part of the beach or the, the upper beach where you lay out your blanket or you see the tides coming in and out, when that sand becomes uh, open and dried, the winds pick up uh, the sand and carry it onshore, usually with onshore winds, carry it and build up these dune systems. And the, the plants are essentially what traps that sand and, and begins to build the dunes. So any of these will actually survive uh, away from that area, but uh, what I uh, re often refer to is they will vegetate. That is, they don't produce a lot of flowers. They don't uh, they don't grow monstrous monstrously large like you you see on some of the, the beaches. But you can get sea oats, for example, to grow in a in a native garden in, uh, in the downtown Wilmington, for that matter. So those are uh, some of the plants that you find along the coast, all natives. Uh, American beach grass in the southeastern North Carolina is a little bit out of place because that's beyond its, its natural limit, but it does grow well. It doesn't flower, surprisingly, uh, here in the southeast. All right, looking, <clears throat> looking a little further inland, especially on the Outer Banks, for example, uh, where we have a lot of flat lands where, which may have been washed over by storm tides and, and the dunes may be flattened out, for example, you're gonna find some more grasses, the dune hair grass, field love grass, salt meadow cord grass, and uh, the broom sedge. All those grasses grow extremely well in sandy soils, they will uh, be buried every once in a while, as you can see in that field love grass picture. Uh, there is a little wind shadow there where sand is accumulated around that plant, but the others uh, don't necessarily need uh, any sand burial. They'll grow uh, well in any case. And then you have some broadleaf plants, and these are a couple examples, seaside uh, goldenrod and uh, wax myrtle. Both of those plants uh, grow nicely in these flat areas. They've got generally deep roots. Uh, oftentimes the, do, the roots not only are, are deep, but they're, they're wide spreading. And so they're able to, to accumulate water uh, with the rains. And even though after the sands dry, they, they may have uh, uh, deep, deeper roots that will tap some of the water that's below the surface of the sand. So these plants are all, again, plants that have beautiful flowering structures. Look at the maritime bushy broom sedge. And I'm looking out the window. As I look out the window at my own house, I've got maritime bushy broom sedge. It's not quite in the flowering stage yet. Another uh, 10, 12 days, it'll start to be flowering. Uh, and uh, this forms a beautiful uh, area where you've got uh, several of these planted. You get a beautiful structure uh, to the plants. And so this particular plant, uh, I love it since I've got it here in the yard because in the, in the springtime, it's one of the earliest grasses to come out and uh, it will be green much of the summer. It grows sometimes very tall, five or six feet, and then puts out that flowering head in late September, early October. After the seeds are dispersed, it turns a real uh, tawny brown color, a gray, almost uh, deer skin color. And uh, as the winter uh, comes on, uh, the entire plant turns that color. And it, it gives a different contrast to some of the evergreen plants, say, here along the coast that, uh, that are evergreen all year long. Uh, and that makes a nice contrast both in color and in texture. So that's maritime bushy blue broom sedge, a great example of a, a native plant that you don't normally see in your backyard, so to speak, but can be planted, will grow very nicely and produce beautiful plants. Now the trees, trees are, are both an asset and a liability when we 
you know, when you think about trees along the, the coast and the maritime forest, you often think about hurricanes and up oh, those trees are going to be down. Um, not so. Um, many of these trees and, and the ones I've got listed here are good examples of trees that survive storms. They won't survive 100%. If you've got a weak tree of a live oak, you're going to have that uh, tree, large branch or the entire tree uh, toppled during a hurricane. Uh, but the, the trees in general that I've got here on this slide grow very nicely. Black gum is interesting in that it, it's found throughout the entire state, all the way from the mountains to the swamps and the coast. And uh, it's, it's not very common anywhere but it's present everywhere. And it's a, it's a very nice plant, beautiful fruits, as you can see, and, and wildlife food. And uh, you can plant these in your, your yard. You usually plant them in a small group, uh, any of these plants, and uh, they will probably uh, grow much better and survive longer when they're in a small clump. And uh, these, these particular plants have beautiful fruits, uh, some of them have beautiful flowers like the holly and they will provide food. You can see that the holly would have seeds that would be available for uh, birds and other uh, organisms as well as the black gum which has, has some nice fruits and obviously the, the oaks have acorns which would be feeding the squirrels and other kinds of wildlife, so little mice and rats that run around in the, the understory. So choosing a native plant instead of uh, a uh, commercially available non-native tree of one sort or another would be a very, very uh, interesting thing to do. And you can be proud of that in a few years when those grow so nicely and grow fairly rapidly because they're adapted to this environment and adapted to Southeastern uh, the United States for that matter and grow very, very well in this kind of environment. Another one you're probably quite familiar with is uh, almost an iconic uh, kind of, of plant, the cabbage palmetto. And, uh, you know, North Carolina or South Carolina, that's the state tree. I think it's also the state tree of Florida. Uh, if you look on the quarters you're going to you know they change a 25 cent piece if you look at a quarter you're going to see palmettos even depicted on uh, South Carolina I think and Florida both have this particular plant as uh, depicted on a, on a quarter so it's very important to to these areas and with climate change with the uh, southeastern North Carolina warming up a bit uh, cabbage palmetto is extending is range and is much more common now in southeastern North Carolina than it was because it was pretty much restricted <coughs> to South Carolina and further south. But nowadays you see it growing nicely in uh, in southeastern North Carolina. So it we'll probably will continue to migrate northward as our uh, climate change impacts the coastal area. Well, this, this particular tree can literally be almost uh, blown where the, 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 uh, the tops of the trees touch the ground and just snap back into place after it's, it's, uh, the storm has passed. And so it's very capable of surviving storms. And that's really what you want around here uh, in the coastal area. One you might not think of, and that's why I thought I'd, I'd depict it here, uh, is persimmon. Persimmons are really, really well adapted to the coastal area. They, they can survive a little bit of, of salt uh, spray, and they love sandy soils. And when you've got nothing but pure sand, and you've got a hot, sandy, open area, uh, the persimmons grow very, very nicely. And the flowers there are depicted in the lower right. So at certain times of the year, you're going to find flowers on the tree. And, uh, you know, you can remember the native fruits there of the persimmon, which 
uh, can be eaten when they're fully ripe. And so that's a, an interesting plant. So it provides food for people as well as for, uh, for wildlife, as well as uh, a, a, a nice pattern of verticality, so to speak, in, the, in a native garden. Marshes, the tidal marshes, the ones that are generally wet. Uh, there's two main species, the smooth cordgrass and the black needle rush. And these species are well adapted to this kind of environment. And for the most part, this is probably where they grow best. You can grow smooth cordgrass. You could, you could take a plant of this and bring it to your common garden, or you could put it in a pot and it will grow and it will probably even flower. But uh, uh, this particular kind of plant, if you've got, if you are right directly on the coast and you've got a, a bank along the edge of the tidal marsh that's, that's barren or very poorly developed, you can buy uh, these plants and, uh, from native gardens and plant them, uh, plant them out into that kind of area and uh, they will grow. So it's a, it's a very nice uh, couple of plants that will give a little diversity to an area that probably is, is neglected in many uh, coastal uh, settings in terms of where houses are, are constructed because they, they don't wanna mess with getting down into that marsh. But uh, as native plant aficionados here, we all wanna get our feet dirty and our hands dirty every once in a while. And this salt marsh is a great place to do both of those. And these plants will, will thrive in that area. So if you're in a specific locale, these are great plants. Another one that I really, really enjoy is C. oxi. It's, a, it's in the composite family. It looks like a, a daisy. And uh, this particular plant grows very well in the salt marsh. It's a kind of a colonial plant. It has underground rhizomes and will extend. You can take a, a single plant or a small group of plants and outplant them in, uh, along the upper edge or in the, the middle of the tidal marsh if you happen to have one. And uh, it will extend, it will, it will gradually increase its, its area of coverage. And, and during the middle of the summertime, you have essentially a, a daisy-like plant growing uh, in your marsh. And you, again, this is a, a plant that you could grow in, the, in a freshwater environment or uh, where you have to keep it a little bit wet, not necessarily with salt water, but with, with uh, fresh water you can grow this plant and uh, it will survive. Now I've talked about uh, the, the dunes, talked about the uh, wetlands, uh, the salt marshes, and I've mentioned the grasslands. I've mentioned uh, salt meadow cordgrass a couple, three times. In fact, three times because it is very adaptable to growing in the dunes where there's plenty of sand burying it. It will grow in the maritime grasslands where there's a lot less sand movement, but it's uh, fairly uh, high and, and fairly dry. And it will also grow in the upper edge of the tidal marsh. So here's a plant that uh, if you need plant coverage or you would like to, to have a display of grasses, uh, this will grow in, in many different kinds of habitats. And I just wanted to highlight the salt meadow cordgrass as being so adaptive uh, to, or adapted to many different coastal environments that you can really find it in several locations. And then some other tidal marsh plants that, that would add some color, as I mentioned at the, at the beginning of talking about uh, the marshes, the tidal marshes. They're fairly monotonous with a couple of species, but there are also little bits of color here and there. And you can see sea lavender and glasswort are two other examples. And, and they're not the only two, that's just examples that I'm showing you that will grow in uh, the, the marshy areas and, and well as, as the upper edge of the salt marsh. And so you can provide some diversity, some uh, 
opportunity for uh, insects to uh, to pollinate and and just enjoy the color changes that you see in dwarf glasswort over the uh, the year. So it, it's a couple of plants that are very very nice to to have if you'd like to diversify what you've got in a coastal environment. Okay, so um, you've seen a number of, of coastal plants, and this is that's just a, a smattering. That's just the uh, the upper layer, so to speak, of, of the kind of plants you can find in the coastal area. But people have said, oh, those are not enough. I want something else. And so they've invited beach vitex, for example, into uh, the coastal area. It actually was uh, brought to the United States from, uh, from the Pacific, the Western Pacific Ocean, uh, Japan, China, Korea, in that area. And these plants were brought over ostensibly to stabilize the dunes. And really, it was Hurricane Hugo that stimulated this back in 1989. And uh, they brought these plants in. Beautiful plants, as you can see. They, they've got a nice uh, wide green leaf. They've got beautiful purple flowers. And even the fruits are interesting. There's little uh, structures that, that are in a clump uh, on a fruiting stalk. And it worked really, really well. I mean, really well. I mean, really well. Within a few years where they initially planted this on dunes that had been disturbed, it took over. It eliminated everything. It was a solid dune of beach vitex. So people were a little concerned that this, although it's, it's very beautiful and, and it's got some texture and structure to it, um, it, it was concerning. The issue was brought to a head when it started growing off the dune off the dune on the front side, down into the upper edge of the beach. They would grow right off the dune and, and move oceanward. That's when the turtle people got into it. And they said, you yeah, better get this plant off the beach because this is where our turtles nest, right at the base of the dunes and they can't dig in this hole because they're used to their holes for depositing their eggs because they're used to an open beach where there is no vegetation. So immediately there was work uh, to be done to take care of this plant. And there have been task force in both North Carolina, South Carolina, and probably elsewhere that have fought this plant for, for a number of years now and been quite successful at it. And it, it it is most uh, offensive near the ocean. And as you get further back, the plant gets a little better behaved. So they're looking for it constantly with task force out walking the beach, looking for uh, growth of this plant and ripping them up as best they can. It's hard to get rid of, so it's gotta be constant. So that's one of our, our nasty little friends, bad news. Phragmites, many of you are familiar with this along the uh, brackish water, even almost into freshwater environments uh, along the coastal area. It, this particular plant grows oh, anywhere from 10 to 15 feet tall. And you can see it's got a huge flowering head. So it, it spreads easily. It must germinate like mad. And uh, it also, each plant extends itself each year. It's a perennial. It has an underground rhizome, so it extends further and further. And it is so dense in many places that even the, the animals, little mice or uh, raccoons or whatever that might go in this area either for shelter or habitat of some sort or looking for food, uh, have abandoned it and it, it's not productive at all. You see the red-winged blackbird sitting in the top of the 
the, uh, the plant looking for, uh, for something to do. But other than that, uh, this is really not useful at all for wildlife. And as I say, it, it, it gradually takes over wetlands. And when it does, it displaces everything, just like uh, the previous plant. It will displace all the native plants. So another no-no. Another one that's more of a, a, a no-no uh, as a result of, of its presence is the thorny eleagnus. And this is a plant that when you uh, put it in the ground, it, it's a cute little plant, but it quickly gets out of control. It's ugly, as you can see in that lower left-hand uh, photo. It really is quite ugly looking plant if it's not maintained at all. And you can see a two-story building there that, that, that is eventually going to have uh, no views if, uh, if they let this particular plant continue to grow. So this is an especially bad one. Uh, the birds love the fruits, as you can see, there's some nice attractive juicy fruits there. But uh, one of the things they do is they love those fruits, they eat the fruits, and then they poop the fruit seeds. And as a result, the birds are responsible for spreading this. So it winds up in places where you don't want it. So the th thorny eleagnus is an example of several species of eleagnus that have been imported uh, that are not attractive. So we'll look at one more, uh, the Chinese tallow. This is a plant, and if we're talking about southeastern North Carolina, this, this was not a big deal. Uh, I know and uh, I've done research in the coastal area for going on uh, over 50 years now. And uh, this was not present in southeastern North Carolina for a long time, nor was Phragmites for that matter. But it has been uh, introduced and is really finding its home here. Again, it was invited in as an ornamental. It's got a, a beautiful, interesting flower structure there on the lower right. The fruits are interesting, it's called the popcorn tree and you can see why it's with the, the three white fruits on it uh, in, a, in a large head. Uh, it makes for an interesting plant, but it is, once it gets into a wetland area, it just reproduces like hell. And I, as you note here, I've got written, uh, the plant, reproduces when it's three years old. Most trees, oh, 15 years, 20 years, 25 years before you see the first fruits of, of a, uh, a tree, like a hickory. But here, uh, this plant immediately begins to flower and fruit and reproduce. And as a result, it, it spreads very, very rapidly. And it's very, very difficult to get rid of. So if you see that triangular shaped leaf begin to appear anywhere around your uh, property, you want to, uh, to get rid of that plant, pull it up and, and uh, keep checking to make sure it doesn't reappear and get rid of it as fast as you can. All right, I thought I'd just, uh, uh, as we cl get close to the end here, talk about uh, a couple of plants that, that are, are of interest to, to uh, people. And uh, again, this is a plant that I have uh, on our property in the back and, and other people that live near the coast would, would uh, probably enjoy. This is a large dandelion. This, is, this plant, again, is in the Asteraceae and, and it's, it's almost tree size. It's a fairly rapid grower, so you could plant it uh, in an area. It will grow up and, and be 15 or 20 feet tall in just a few years. Uh, the, the wood is fairly brittle, uh, and it's easy to, to uh, uh, cut, cut the plant down and, and make it disappear, so to speak. So if you wanted to, to rejuvenate a, 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 an area, uh, plant this particular plant. We're about to see this uh, 
developing in the coastal area here. If you travel to Raleigh, for example, you'll see this plant in the next oh, 30 to 50 days. It will be blooming like that photograph on the left of, and the flowers that you are close up on the right. Uh, this particular plant will uh, have a nice fall coloration. And so when things are dying back uh, in each fall, this plant will just be coming online. So you get color for a longer period of time in your native garden. So sea myrtle is one that, that might be interesting to, uh, to consider as a plant. It, uh, it will grow easily and once you get it started, it will continue to grow. As I say, you can trim it if you'd like, or uh, for that matter, you can just cut it down and start over again with a smaller uh, tree because it's not, it's not a long-lived tree. It's more of a, a shrub, large shrub. One of the plants that I really enjoy, if you've got uh, uh, some trees that will get a little bit of sun uh, over a, a day's period, uh, to have resurrection fern growing on it. This plant will grow, especially on live oaks where the bark is really uh, crusty and uh, water holds well on it. Uh, this plant will grow very nicely. It doesn't uh, grow into the tree. It's, it doesn't have uh, roots or hostoria that grow into the tree, but it will hold onto the tree by uh, putting out small roots that entwine with the, the, the crusty bark. And uh, it's enjoyable to see this plant in the middle of the summertime, like that lower photograph uh, showing the plant all dried up. You say, oh man, this thing will never survive. It's gone. And in a few months or a few days after, actually, uh, after uh, a good rain, it'll look like the photograph in the center. And it's a fern, as you can see. Uh, it's got the fruiting structures, the sori on the, on the bottom of the leaf and uh, it may actually expand both by uh, growth of the, the plant and, and subdivision of leaves or of, of the, the stems as well as uh, by sexual reproduction here of these spores. So very nice plant, something that's it's an oddity and something you can talk about. So I wanted to, to show that. And the same thing goes for mistletoe. You don't think of mistletoe as something, a particular plant that, that is interesting, but it really is. You can see the flowers. I show you the male and female flowers, which are quite different and distinct. It's an evergreen. It stays green, as you can see on this uh, red maple tree. It stays green all year long. And it's got beautiful white berries, if you remember as a kid, having uh, mistletoe to chase the, the, the boys and girls around and, and give them a kiss there at Christmas time. So mistletoe is uh, what's called a hemiparasite. It's obviously green, so it carries on its own photosynthesis, but it also has small hostoria, what's called hostoria, that are, are, are kind of roots that grow into the plant. They don't kill the plant. They don't have any negative, real negative impact on the plant. And it makes for a conversation piece, especially during the winter time when you don't have anything else to talk about in terms of, of your native plant garden. Maybe you can show the folks uh, the forward end and Leucarpum, uh, the American mistletoe. So that gives you, I think, a sort of a broad paintbrush picture uh, of the kinds of plants that are uh, available in, in the coastal area that can be adapted to a native plant garden or a particular area of interest that you might have. And I'm really, as I mentioned at the outset, I'm really here as a cheerleader to say, uh, let's, let's look at the kinds of plants that are out there. There really are nice plants. And so I've just put a montage here of, uh, uh, or a collage, of uh, plants like the thistle. You wouldn't think of, hey, let's put out a thistle and see that, that uh, in a common garden, but it really is an interesting plant to have. Beautiful, stunning plants like seashore mallow, a, a small shrub 
you know, will grow very nicely. Obviously, the goldenrod, beautyberry, haven't shown you one with the plant, the uh, fruits, but uh, beautyberry is one that is very easy to grow. The birds love the fruits, and so they send the seeds all over your yard. And after you plant beautyberry, uh, what I find is wherever the seeds land and, and grow, if it looks like a good spot to say, let's have a little beautyberry, I leave it. If not, I pull it up and there's plenty of others around the yard to, uh, to see and, and uh, have in your, own, in your own native plant garden. Obviously, Spanish dagger there too. So there, there are some flowers, for example, that, uh, that are very interesting. And they have timing in terms of the flowers from early spring, with the, say, with the common thistle, to, to midsummer with the beautyberry, to uh, seaside goldenrod, which is, is during the, the late summer, early fall. So you have co color all the time with these uh, native plants. And not only do you have flowers, but you have fruits. Uh, here's the beautyberry fruit. You can see a beautiful mauve purplish color. I really like that color. It's, uh, it's stunning and a beautyberry uh, is, as I say, very easy to grow. Flowering dogwood, we have dogwoods in the yard that, uh, that are very nice. Climbing hempweed I put in there because it's not something you, you would see. It's, it's a vine and it has interesting flowers. It's, it's in, the, uh, in the aster family, the composites. And uh, at the end of the year, we have a nice uh, distribution of, of fruits and it makes for a, a stunning pattern. Prickly pear cactus, purple passion flower, uh, you're probably familiar with those, and they have uh, very attractive and interesting fruits. But again, as you're building up a, a, uh, an area of native plants, gives you a, a different textures, different colors, and, and makes it for a very interesting backyard, or front yard, or side yard, or wherever yard. All right, so just to, to, to kind of bring this to a close, what we've seen here, and sort of capturing what we've said, uh, the coastal native plants grow in, in a variety of sizes, shapes that we've seen. They're well adapted, so they grow nicely in the coastal habitat. They're, we've seen colorful ones, we've seen useful ones. These are uh, the what native plants do for us. And also uh, caution you that, that the bad apples, the bad guys, uh, we want to get rid of those. So as, as best we can, as soon as you can replace them, get rid of them and replace them with natives, uh, everybody will be a lot happier, including your neighbors, probably, because most of these bad apples uh, spread very easily and take hold and if you turn your back on them they will take over. All right so the last bit of advice I might have is is you know where where do you put these plants which which ones are you going to use and these are just some guidelines here by consulting your professionals the master gardeners are a great resource to provide information. The Sea Grant Program does, does the same as well as the North Carolina Coastal Federation. And uh, get on your phone, take a look at uh, what's available and uh, see what information you can, you can gain, what plants are most successful. And uh, the last bit of, of information would be watch out what you ask for because when you begin planting these plants that may be pollinated, be pollinated by native uh, insects or fed upon by the insects or insect larvae and the birds, the mammals, small mammals and, and deer and all that. So they all come with bringing in the native plants. Uh, many yards are sterile because the, the deer don't recognize any of those plants. <laughs> And they go, well, let's go next door where I know what some of these plants are and we'll have a good meal. Uh, so you, you do want to 
have native plants, but you also uh, get some of the native animals. And that, uh, that in itself is an attraction, so to speak, because you begin to see butterflies and uh, birds and, and little animal, little creatures of one sort or another that you, you have not seen before because you didn't have the native plants in abundance like you would uh, if you uh, focused on those. So with that, I'll say thank you very much for joining me for the length of time that we've had here today. I hope that uh, you've got something interesting out of that. And again, I'll turn the meeting back to Charlie. Thank you, Paul. Uh, one thing I want to close with, I don't know if you can see it on the on the video or not, but I can name it. Paul has came out with a book several years ago called Seacoast Plants of the Carolinas. And besides being a good guide to the plants, the first eight chapters or so are a fantastic discussion of the ecology, the environment along our coast here, and it's well worth reading for that alone. But I thank you all, and we will see you some other time.